Hey everyone, welcome to week two of Computer Science 225. This week we're going to be learning about managing files and directories on the command line. This is probably the most important week of the whole class because if you can't really um, find your way around the directory system and you can't uh, create files and copy and move files and deal with directories and stuff like that, it's really, really hard to do anything else on the command line at all. So this week we're going to start by talking about um, the directory system in general, which um, really directory systems are sort of the same concept regardless of what operating system you're on, whether it's Unix or Windows or Mac or whatever. Um, then we'll talk about how we navigate through the directory system, sort of moving from one place to another while also keeping track of where we currently are at. Um, then we'll also talk about how do you list the files that are in a directory, how do you make files, how do you make directories, how do you copy and move files and directories around, how do you get rid of or delete files and directories, um, all that kind of stuff. So um, like I said, this is really important when you're working on the command line to be able to move around and uh, edit the directory system, basically all of the sort of programming work or IT work that you would do on a command line system involves um, changing and moving and adding and replacing files. So this is all, like I said, super important for this class. Um, this, I think, material is even more important nowadays because um, sort of in the old days of using uh, graphical operating systems like Windows and uh, OS X and even graphical versions of Linux, you really, as a user of those operating systems, need it to work with your files and directories and move around and stuff like that, all the kinds of things we'll talk about today. But sort of the modern trend in operating system design for like the modern versions of Windows and the modern versions of Mac, they try to hide from the user what's really going on. They don't make it clear that you're dealing with a directory tree. Um, they sort of just, uh, you know, show you your most recent files and things like that and they make it sort of hard to see how the things are really laid out. And so because of that, I think people nowadays are, um, need some more time to sort of get used to and learn uh, their way around the directory tree. But as a software developer or even as somebody who's sort of a power user um, working in IT or something similar to that, you really need to know um, how the directory tree is actually laid out and how to navigate it and deal with it effectively. So that's why we're doing that this week. And uh, really the material you learn here in this week will practice sort of out of necessity for all of the subsequent weeks of this class because like I said, you pretty much always on the command line need to know where you're at and need to be able to interact with the files and directories that are in your system. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So the root of the directory tree on Unix is called slash. Everything, every file and every directory in a Unix system is under slash. On Windows, this is sort of akin to the C colon backslash um, directory, where usually on Windows systems, everything sort of starts out as. Um, Windows does it a little bit differently because like other drives will have um, sort of their own letters, but on Linux and Unix systems generally, including Mac, the slash is the start of everything. Slash is the root. Now under slash, there's some number of directories and files. Every directory in uh, Unix systems can have directories and files underneath of it. Now the slash directory has some important things under it, most of which you won't really need to use very much uh, or ever as, as a user of a Unix system. For instance, under slash is bin. So we have under slash, we have slash bin. Um, that's where sort of system programs go. Then there's slash etc, which is where like configuration files for the system will go. There's slash usr. And under slash USR, there's things like slash USR slash bin, where like system programs go and things like that. And under the slash, there's also slash TMP, which is where you can put temporary files. And for your purposes as a user of a Unix system, the most important one is slash home, which is where user directories are going to go. So on the CPSC server, all of your files and things that you make will be under the slash home. Now, often on uh, Unix systems, under slash home, you'll have sort of directly the user directories, but on the CPSC server, we set it up a little bit different. Under slash home, we have slash home slash students. 
and we also have slash home slash faculty. So your um, student accounts are sort of in one subdirectory and the faculty accounts are in another subdirectory. Now, let's say if your name is like Elizabeth Martin, your home directory will be based off of your net ID. So your full home directory might be something like slash home, slash students, slash, let's say your net ID is emartin3. That would be the home directory for your system. And so this directory is where all of your stuff goes, but you should know that it's part of sort of this larger directory structure. It's recursive in a way, so every directory has a parent directory, except for the slash, which is the root of everything. So to get to your home directory, you could start in slash, then you could go to the home directory, then you could go to the students directory under that, and then you could go to the emartin3 directory, which is under that. So let's see what that looks like in terms of the actual command line system that we're dealing with. All right, so here we have a terminal window which is logged into the CPSC server. Now the first command we'll talk about today is the PWD command, which stands for Present Working Directory. Whenever you're logged in on the command line system, you're always in one directory, and it's important to know much of the time what directory you're in so that you'll know where in the file system you are, where you're making files, where you're doing stuff. So PWD, when you run it, it just prints one line of output, which is the directory of wherever you're currently at. So when you first log in, you'll be in your home directory, which for me is slash home slash faculty slash ifinlay. Yours would be slash home slash students slash whatever your username is, whatever your net ID is. So PWD is a good command if you sort of are not sure where you're at and need to find that out. The next command we'll talk about is the cd command, which stands, stands for change directory. This allows you to move from one place in the file system to another. So you do the cd command by typing cd and then the name of the directory that you want to move to. So I can go to the very root of the file system by typing cd slash like this. Now if I do pwd, it will tell me that we've moved to just slash. The, bash prompt, which is the sort of text that uh, is to the left of where you start typing your command. By default, it also sort of shows you where you are. So by default, it uh, sort of depicts this. So right now you can see there's a slash right here before the dollar sign. That's also a hint as to where you're at in the file system. So when we're doing the cd command, there's really sort of two ways that we can reference where it is that we want to go next. The first is with an absolute path. So if we type cd, and then we begin typing where we want to go, starting with the slash, that makes it an absolute path, which means that we specify from the root directory all the way down where we want to be going to. So I can go to my home directory by typing cd to slash home, slash faculty, slash ifinlay, and that will bring me back home. And you can see pwd is back into my home directory. Likewise, if uh, I wanted to go to the slash uh, temp directory where temporary files are stored, I can type cd into slash temp. Or I can do cd into usr slash bin, uh, which is where like program files are stored on the Linux system. So whenever you begin typing the place that you want to go with this uh, forward slash right here, it's an absolute path. And that means that when you um, when you give this directory, it doesn't matter where, where you currently are. You will go directly to this place. So if I'm in slash user slash bin, I can go home again by starting it with the slash and giving it an absolute path of my home directory like this. The other way of specifying where you want to go next with the cd command is to use what's called a relative path. Now a relative path is based on where you currently are. So for example, if I am in my home directory, I have some subdirectories within this. And so if I want it to go into the project one directory, I can do it just by typing cd into project one. This is a relative path because it is relative to where I currently am, which in this case was my home directory. So with a relative path, you can only go into the things that exist where you're currently at. If I go to the slash directory, the root, and I type cd project one, it's not going to work because relative to the root directory, there is nothing called project one. You can only use a relative path 
uh, if wherever you're currently at has the thing you want to go into. So if I type ls right now, you can see that there is nothing called project1 here, and so I can't cd into that with a relative path. If I want it to um, cd into it from slash, I either have to use the absolute path, which would be home faculty i finlay slash project1, which will take me there. Or what I can do is if I'm in the slash directory, I can do cd home. That is a relative path because in slash there is something called home. And so I can use the relative path to first go into the home directory. Then I can use the cd directory to go into faculty. Then I can use cd to go into ifinlay. Then I can use cd to go into project one. So here, um, with this first command, I use the absolute path to get directly from slash into project one. And then with this other sort of way of doing it, I um, sort of did relative paths to go one step down the ladder each time, first into home, then into faculty, then into ifinlay, and then into project one. And so that's using relative paths. Um, another thing I can do is I can use relative paths with sort of um, multiple stages. So I can, if I'm in my home directory, I have project one inside of here. And inside of project one, there's a directory called tests. And so I can do cd project one slash tests. And that will take me into the um, test directory, which is inside project one, which is inside my home directory of ifinlay. So whether you're doing an absolute path like this, or whether you're doing a relative path, path like this, you can have sort of multiple steps of it. You can say, I want to cd into the project one directory. And because it doesn't start with a slash, it's relative. And so that means the project one directory of the directory I'm currently in. And then into that, I also want to go into the test directory. So it can have sort of multiple steps like this. That's also true of an absolute path. Of course, you can have slash home slash faculty. You can have multiple sort of steps along the directory path like that. OK, so I did this command ls a couple of times now. We should talk about what the ls command does. What it does is it lists the files and directories of wherever you're currently at. So if I go back to my home directory, I can do it with an absolute path, remember, like this, ifinlay. If I type ls, it will list all of the things that are stored in this directory. By default, ls is kind of helpful in that it colors the output. The things that are colored blue by default are directories. And the things that are colored white are just files. So I have three, uh, four, five directories, and then two files. This one ending with a tilde is just a backup file. So if I go into another directory, like project one here, and type ls again, it will list me all of the files that are in this directory. So pwd tells you where you are in the file system, and ls tells you what files are stored wherever you're currently at. In this case, I have several Java files, um, a couple of shell scripts, and then another directory called tests. The ls command, um, let me go back to my home directory. One uh, tip with the cd command is if you just type cd by itself, it will always take you home. And so if you don't give cd any kind of argument, by default, it takes you to your home directory. Let me also clear the screen. With the ls command, if you do ls and you don't give it any sort of arguments at all, it prints the directory listing, that's what ls stands for, by the way, is listing, of where you currently are. But you can also give ls a argument of the file or directory that you want a listing of. And so this is helpful if I want to see what was in the project one directory without needing or wanting to cd into it, I can just type ls project one, and it will give me a list of those files. You can do multiples of these at once. I can ask for a listing of project one, and then also public HTML say, and then it will give me a listing for both of those directories. So ls takes arguments, where the arguments are the directories or files that you want listings of. Just like cd, this works with both relative and also absolute paths. So if we wanted to see what was in slash temp, we can give it an absolute path. Of course, I can't use a relative path here because I don't have anything called tmp in my home directory. But there is a tmp directory in the slash um, root directory. So I can use an absolute path to get that. And you can see 
the TMP directory usually has a bunch of nonsense. Programs are allowed to write sort of temporary files in there, so there's just some stuff we don't really need to worry or care about what that is. Um, so ls takes arguments like slash temp or project one. They can be relative or absolute paths, and it will list for you the files that are in those places. In addition to arguments, ls also takes a number of options or flags. So one of the more um, commonly done ones is ls minus a. ls minus a will list all of the files that you have wherever you want the listing done. So if I do ls minus a in my home directory, you'll actually see that there's a bunch of other stuff that isn't in the normal listing. The normal listing just has a few things, whereas the minus a listing gives us all the files, which includes other things. Specifically, what it includes is all of these files and directories that start with a dot. If something starts with a dot in uh, Linux, it is a hidden file or a hidden directory. So this is sort of a simple scheme for specifying that a file or a directory um, is sort of uh, what, it, what, what we mean by hidden is that it doesn't by default display with ls. And in general, the hidden directories are things that like you didn't make yourself. They're not really your files. They're just made by the programs that you're using. So for example, when we um, talked about doing SSH, one of the things that was optional was setting up the SSH keys. And to do that, you need to go into this .ssh directory. This .ssh directory stores sort of program settings for the SSH program. They're not really your files per se. They're not things that you will have made and things that you'll want to edit or CD into or really care about. And so by naming them with a dot, they are sort of hidden out of the way where you don't need to see them unless you really, really want to or need to. Likewise, other programs like Bash we'll talk about has a number of hidden files. We'll talk about the Bash profile later on in this course. Likewise, Vim has .vimrc, which we'll talk about later. These are sort of like um, program configurations. Uh, there's a number of other ones, things related to MySQL, which is a database, other stuff like that. By default, they're not shown because, like I said, you don't really need to care about them most of the time. But if you want to see them, then you can do ls minus a to get them. Your home directory is going to have a few things that are hidden that start with a dot. Um, if you go into another directory, usually there won't be many things that are hidden that start with a dot unless you've sort of yourself specifically made something like that. When we talk about Git, we'll also talk about where we will also ourselves make a hidden file for doing the Git configuration for a project. Um, usually there's uh, only a couple of things that start with dot, which is the dot itself. Um, you can see here every directory actually has something inside of it called dot, which is sort of a special directory. What that means is it's a uh, reference to the directory itself wherever we currently are. So if we do cd dot, it will take us to the same place we are. And doing ls dot is the same thing as doing ls by itself. Uh, this is not super useful uh, in this particular instance, but dot is a reference to the directory wherever we're currently stored. Dot dot is a reference to the directory um, one above us wherever we currently are. It's a reference to our parent directory. So if you want to go from the project one directory back to your home directory, one way to do that is to say cd dot dot, which will take you one level above wherever you currently are. If I'm in my home directory, which is slash home slash faculty slash ifinlay, and I do cd dot dot, it'll take me up to home faculty. And then, of course, I can do cd uh, just by itself to go back to my home directory always. OK, so that's the minus a option and hidden files. Now we can talk about another flag to ls, which is the minus l option. So by default, ls only shows you the files and directories names, uh, just, just their names. Um, the, we can also see extra information about them by typing the ls minus l flag. The dash l stands for long listings, so we'll see more information about the files and directories that we're talking about. So you can see if I do just ls by itself, it gives me just the names, whereas if we do ls minus l, it gives rather more information and sort of a row for each file or directory, and then various columns showing us some more extended kind of information. So the columns here, we uh, 
some of them we won't really ever care about. Um, the first one is the permissions, which we're going to talk about in detail in a later week of this class. The next one is the number of sort of references to this file or directory. We won't really need to worry about that um, really ever. Um, the next one is the owner of the file, and I own all of these files. When you type ls-l, it should give your username for the files and directories that you've made. Next is the group of the file. Um, this can be used for sort of allowing multiple um, people in one group, which you can create to access a file. It usually doesn't come up, but my group is faculty. Then there's the size of the file or directory in bytes. Now, all directories on this implementation of Linux anyway um, are four kilobytes large. So all the directories are, will always say 4K. If we want to find out sort of the total size of a directory and all the stuff in it, there's a different way to do that, which we'll talk about. For a file, it's just how many bytes is that file. This program.py file is just 93 bytes. Then it gives you the last um, modification time of that file. So this um, program.py, I edited it, in fact, today. And so it says January 11th at uh, 2.15. Um, some of these other ones are older. I haven't touched my bin directory since October 11th, for instance. Um, and so uh, that just shows you when the thing was last modified, if that matters. And then last, of course, is just the name. Now, we've seen two flags, the ls-a, which shows all files, and the ls-l, which so shows sort of more details on all your files. These can be combined together. So there are several ways you can do that. We can type ls-a-l, and that will show all of our files with all of the detailed information about them. We could do them in any order. So we could do dash L dash A. That works as well. It gives us the same output. We could also instead, if we wanted to, put them together. So we can just say dash AL. And that lets us sort of give the hyphen and then give however many options we want to. So dash AL does the same thing. And of course, dash LA does the same thing. So when you have options, you can sort of separate them out one by one like this if you want. Or you can just put them sort of all together after the one hyphen. You can also combine up the options with arguments. So let me clear the screen. So for instance, if we want to give a long listing of everything in our project one directory, we can do that like this. We can say ls. Then we give the options, and then we give the uh, argument that we want to give, which in this case was project one. So we can combine up the options with the arguments like that. And now we've given ls the dash l and dash a options, telling it to do a long listing of all the files, and also give it the argument of project one. Now, there's a couple extra directories that are listed inside of the project one directory when we did this. One of them starts with dot, or one of them is just called dot, and one of them is called dot dot. Because these technically start with dots, they are considered hidden directories. And they will actually be in every single um, directory that you list. So if we go into project one and do ls-a, we see the dot and the dot dot. If we go into the tests subdirectory and do ls-a, we'll see the dot and the dot dot as well. What these are is these are sort of like special directories in the Linux file system that refer to specific things. Dot means wherever we're currently at. So if you do cd dot, it does nothing because dot is an alias for the current directory wherever you are. There's really not much point in doing cd dot. We could do ls dot, which is just the same thing as typing ls just by itself. So in these particular instances, there's not much reason to use the dot, but we'll actually see that there's usages of the dot directory. It always is a reference to the current directory wherever you're currently at. Dot dot comes up more. What dot dot is, is it's a reference to the directory above where we currently are, which is called the parent directory. So if you do cd dot dot, it takes you one level up. So right now, we're in my home directory, which is slash home slash faculty slash ifinlay slash project one slash tests. If I go cd dot dot, it will bring me up to the project one directory. If I do cd dot dot again, it brings me to my home directory. If we do cd dot dot again, it brings me to home faculty. 
If I do cd dot dot again, it brings me to home. And if I do cd dot dot one last time, it brings me up to the slash directory, which is the root of everything. So cd dot dot brings you up one level from wherever you're currently at, which is oftentimes really helpful. So just to review some of these sort of special symbols, um, cd slash takes you to the root directory of everything. cd tilde takes you to your home directory, which for you would be slash home slash students slash your net ID. cd into dot does nothing because cd dot brings you to the current directory, which is where you're already at. And cd dot dot brings you one level above where you currently are. All right, um, let's talk about a couple more flags to um, the uh, ls command. Actually, I just said something that I'm not sure if we talked about. I just typed cd by itself with nothing. If you do cd with no arguments at all, it does the same thing as cd tilde. It brings you to your home directory. So if you ever just want to go home, you can type cd and you'll be there. So we talked about so far the dash a and the dash l flags. Um, one thing about the dash L flag is that when it lists the size of the files, it just does it in bytes. And if you have really big files, then sometimes that isn't super helpful because if it's you know a super long number, it's really hard for us to sort of understand what that refers to. So there's another flag, which is the dash H flag, which we can give, and it stands for human readable. And what it does is it makes these sizes print out in a more human-friendly format. So instead of doing bytes, it'll put it to like the most closest units. So for 93, it left it as bytes. But for these other ones, instead of saying 4096, it writes it as 4.0K, standing for 4 kilobytes. Likewise, if you get into files that are in megabytes and gigabytes, it will use those units. So instead of having like a super long number, it will tell you like 82 megabytes, which is more helpful. A couple of other useful um, arguments that sort of work well with dash L is dash T, which sorts by modification time. So if you want to see like your most recent files, you can give it dash T. And so then the um, modification date will be used for sorting these rows of output instead of just the name of the file sort of alphabetically, which is the default. So we can see that the most recent thing I accessed was project one, and then program.py, and then public, .h, uh, public HTML, and so on. Instead of dash T, we can give it dash capital S, which sorts things by size, which isn't really useful in this case because all of the directories are the same size, and then we just have one file. But if you have lots of files and you want to find like the biggest file, you can sort by size by doing dash s. Another sort of sorting option is dash r, which stands for reverse. So if you sort by something and then do the dash r, it will just reverse the order of whatever it would have previously been. So now it sorts the files by size, but it does it smallest to biggest. We can combine that. And again, we can combine things like this as well. If we do dash LTR, it says sort, uh, or rather show us the output um, of our files with uh, long listings, sort it by the modification time, but also reverse it. So now it has the oldest things first and then the newest things last. You can do just the dash L and the dash R, and then it'll sort it alphabetically, but in reverse order. Now, one of the really most um, uh, widely helpful sort of flags is dash capital R. What dash capital R does is it gives you what's called a recursive listing. And so this will list all of the things that are here and also all of the things that are in those things. So if we do ls dash R, it shows us what's in dot, our home direct or rather our current directory, which is bin, config, grading, all that stuff. And then for each of the directories here, it drills down into those directories and shows you all of the things there as well. So here it shows us what's in the bin directory, what's in the config directory, what's in the grading directory, what's in the project one directory. And then because project one has a directory called tests, it also shows us what's inside of that. And it drills down as many levels as you want, or rather as many levels as there are. Um, then lastly, it shows us that public HTML is empty. So dash R stands for recursive, and it means don't just do the thing here, but go down into all the subdirectories and all the subdirectories of those subdirectories and do the thing as well. In this case, just listing the files. There's um, lots of other commands that take this dash R flag 
and it always means recursive, aka not just here, but in all of the children directory of here as well. OK, so let's clear the screen and talk about our next topic. All right, so we'll look at some commands now for actually interacting with the file system, making directories and files, copying, moving, and deleting things. So we'll start by talking about how you can make directories. So like I've shown you, I have a few directories already in my home directory. We can make new directories with the mkdir command. Now a lot of Unix commands like this are sort of heavily abbreviated, so it's not make directory, it's mkdir. So mkdir takes in the name of the directory we want to create. So if I type like, uh, let's say my project, something like that, and we hit enter, it will have made the directory for that, uh, that text that we put in. That's the name of the directory now. And of course, we can cd into it with the cd command. The directory, of course, is empty uh, because it was just created. Now, one thing about making directories and files sort of in general in Linux is that the file names really shouldn't contain spaces. It will make your life a lot easier if you never put spaces into file names because then when you go to reference them, they have to be like escaped and stuff like that. Uh, in fact, if you give mkdir uh, a name that has spaces in it, like let's say my project2, it actually looks like it works, but it in fact made two different directories. It made my and then it made project two. So we uh, can't easily put spaces in file names, which is why I did a hyphen for this one. Something else about uh, the mkdir command is that it uh, doesn't allow you by default to make sort of nested sets of directories. So if you do something like this and say make dir slash lab one slash tests, if the lab one command uh, rather, if the lab one directory doesn't already exist, this will give you an error saying that it can't create, create the directory because we want it to make a directory in tests uh, that was inside of a directory called lab one, but lab one doesn't exist. There's a sort of common flag to mkdir, which is the dash p command, which will tell it to go ahead and make the parent directory if it doesn't already exist. So if we do mkdir lab one slash tests, then it will go ahead and make that directory structure. So now it put in this directory called lab one. And if we cd into lab one, we'll see that there's a directory inside of that called tests, which we can then go into. And that one itself is empty. I can go back to my home directory now with just doing cd. So that's how you make directories. Now I've made a bunch of directories, and I need to sort of clean things up. So we can talk about the rmdir command. The rmdir command removes directories. So rm stands for remove. So I can remove that my directory that I created and the project2 correct uh, directory that I created and the my project directory by passing them to rmdir. As you can see, you can pass either one directory or multiple directories like this. And now those things should be gone. I can also remove the lab one test directory and then remove the lab one directory itself by passing them as well to rmdir. One thing about remove directory command is that it won't remove directories that have stuff in them. So if we try to remove project one, it will tell us that the directory is not empty because there are, in fact, things inside of there. RMDIR is only for removing empty directories. We'll see in a few minutes here in this video how to uh, remove directories that have things inside of them. But RMDIR isn't for that. It's just for removing empty directories. So that's how we create and remove directories. Now let's talk about how we can create and remove files. So let me make a new directory for this. I'll call it just test. And let's cd into test. Now in this class uh, next, uh, in two weeks rather from now, we're going to learn about the Vim text editor, which will allow you to create files that have text inside of them. So you can write programs and scripts and things like that, or just plain text files on the Linux system. But so that we can talk about copying and moving files, we'll learn a new command, which is the touch command. What touch does is it creates a file if the file doesn't exist. So I can say touch um, file1.txt. And when we do that, it makes a file called file1.txt. The file is empty. So um, if I, for instance, do the ls-l command, 
we'll see that it contains zero bytes. There's nothing actually in there. So the touch command is not something we're going to use like long term. Um, it's not as useful for creating files uh, in general. Usually you'd want to create a file and put stuff in there, which is what we'll learn two weeks from now. But um, just for showing you how to move and copy files, it's helpful to be able to have empty files to just sort of play around with. The real usage of touch actually is to update the timestamp on files. So if I go to my home directory and I do ls minus l, you can see the timestamp, the most recent access of program.py was January 12th at 417. That was in fact yesterday. If I touch the file, that just sort of like updates the timestamp. So now if I do ls minus l, it will be updated to today, January 13th at 338. But um, getting back to dealing with files, if I go back into my test directory and look at this file one.txt, now we can talk about how we copy files. So copies are made with the cp command. Again, lots of abbreviation happening in our command names. So if I want to copy file one.txt uh, and uh, into a new into a new file, I can call it like file two.txt. And what that does is it copies this file into this location. So now I should have two files here. One is file one.txt and the other is file two.txt. They're both empty, but if file one.txt had had stuff in it, it would be duplicated into file two.txt. That's how we make copies. So the first argument to file, one, uh, rather the first argument to the copy command is the file we want to make the copy of. And the second argument can either be the name of another file, in which case it'll just make uh, that have a new name basically in the same directory we're in right now, or we can copy it to another location. So if I make a directory in this directory test called backups, then I can also say copy file one.txt into backups. And this is a common usage of this cp command. So you can either have cp file name file name, in which case uh, this will copy the the file into this sort of second name, it'll duplicate it. Or you can have cp where the first thing is the file that exists and the second thing is the name of a directory that we have. And when we do it this way, it will make a copy of this file into this directory with the same name. So now when we do this, if I ls backups, you'll see that there's also a file one.txt inside of the backups directory. So that's how we use the cp command for copying a file either into a duplicated file with a different name or into a um, different uh, directory. We can also use the cp command for copying an entire directory. So if I have this test directory, if I want to make a copy of it, you can use cp to do that. Like I can say copy test into test2, but by default it will actually not do that it will say dash r not specified, so it's omitting the directory test. Um, I'm not really sure why copy by default doesn't allow you to copy an entire directory, but if you do want to do that, you can pass it the dash r option. Just like ls, dash r here stands for recursive, and it means copy the entire directory and all of the stuff inside of it as well. So with cp dash r, test into test2, it made us a test2, and if we go into test2, we should see that it has the same stuff that our test, uh, regular test directory has. It has file one.txt and file two.txt, and then it has a backups directory which also contains file one.txt. Now, that's copying directories and copying files. We can do a similar thing with the mv command, except that will move the files. So let's say, I'll clear the screen, and here we are right here where we have file one.txt and file two.txt. Now, if we want to, instead of copying file one.txt, what if we want to rename file one.txt? You can do that with the mv or move command. So like cp, mv can be used in sort of two different ways based off what arguments you give it. If we give it the name of a file and then the name of another file, it will um, move that file, renaming it essentially. So if we say move file one.txt to let's say, um, just be boring and say file three.txt, then it will essentially have just renamed it. So file one.txt got renamed to file three.txt. This can rename files. 
what else uh, MV can do is it can move a file from one location into another. Like CP, we do this by having the second argument be um, the name of a directory that exists. So if I say move file 2.txt into backups, then it will change the location of it. Now it's not any longer inside of this test2 directory, but rather it's inside of backups. If we look at backups, it will be there. And then we can move file3.txt into backups as well. So now those directories are just, uh, rather those files are just in our backups directory. Something about uh, MV is that you can use it to accidentally sort of overwrite files. So if I moved file1.txt to file2.txt, then what this will have done is it will have renamed file1.txt to file2.txt, and in doing so, it will have overwritten the file2.txt that existed here. Um, a lot of Unix commands are sort of dangerous in this way in that if you're not really careful, you can accidentally overwrite data that you had wanted to save. Um, there's also no concept in Unix of a recycle bin or anything like that. Even if you're using a system like a graphical version of Linux or Mac OS X where there is a recycle bin thing, usually that doesn't interact with the command line at all. So if you open up your Mac and start doing things on the command line with the RM command, or rather the MV command we're talking about now, the things that get overwritten don't go to your recycle bin. So you have to be a little bit careful. That's one of the reasons that we'll learn um, how to use git in this class so that you can make sure that you have good backups of everything. Um, another thing you can do is instead of using MV, uh, just as it is, you can use MV with the dash I flag. Dash I stands for interactive, and it will sort of ask you or prompt you for confirmation before it does anything dangerous. So if we do mv-i file2.txt onto file3.txt, this would otherwise write uh, over the file3.txt file. But if we do that with the dash i flag, it'll ask us first and say, hey, are you sure you want to do this? And then we can say no, and then it won't do so. Of course, if we say yes here, it will go ahead and overwrite that file. So the dash i option for interactive makes the commands a little safer in that it will check with you first before it overwrites something. In a few weeks, we'll talk about how to make aliases on the command line, and that will allow you to make it so that your MV command always does the dash I option if you want to. Um, but like I said, we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. For now, if you want to be extra safe, you can just make sure to put the dash I in here. Okay, then the last command we'll talk about today is the RM command, which is used for removing files and as also, as we'll see, removing directories. So rmdir is only for removing directories which are empty. If we try to rmdir file3.txt, it will not work. It will say it's not a directory. Instead, we just use rm. rm and then you pass it the name of a file or files, and it will remove them. It deletes them. And like I said, there's no concept of a recycle bin. This file is now just gone. Um, it was empty anyway, so not a big deal this time. But in general, you want to make sure that you are sure you want to remove something before you use the rm command on it. Um, let's go up one directory. Um, and let's make a couple of more files uh, just for um, example's sake. We can make file1.txt again, and let's say file2.txt. Lots of these commands like touch, you can give them multiple files and it will sort of make all of them. So now we have file1.txt and file2.txt. With rm, it also supports the dash i flag. So if you want to, you can make it confirm for you that you really do want to remove this thing and you can either say yes or no before actually going through with it. If we say no, of course, it leaves the file intact. The last and most dangerous usage of RM is for removing directories in their entirety when they have things inside of them. So as we sort of said, I can't remove the test2 directory with RMDIR because it will tell me the directory is not empty. RMDIR is a very safe conservative command, whereas the RM command really isn't. By default, though, if you try to remove a directory with RM, it will tell you it's a directory. You have to give it the dash R flag. Just like for copy, if you want to copy an entire directory and everything inside of it, you need dash R. For ls, if you want to list a directory and all of the subdirectories, you use dash R. 
Likewise, if you want to remove a directory and all of the stuff in it in one fell swoop, we can do the dash r flag. Now test2 and everything in it is gone. Um, I can also do this on the test directory, which as you can see has a directory inside of it and then a couple of files spread throughout it. If we want to get rid of the thing all at once, we can do rm-r test, which will get rid of it all in one go. Of course, you want to be careful with this because there is no really easy way to get this file back once it's been deleted. So that concludes the commands and things that we're looking at this week. We've done a lot of um, big topics that are really super important for the rest of this class. We've talked about how you navigate the file system, how you know where you are. We've talked about absolute versus relative uh, directory paths, which is really important for knowing how to get around different places. And you have to sort of keep in mind whether you're doing something with a relative path or an absolute path to know how it's going to work. Then we've talked about a lot of really core Linux Unix commands that you're going to use just week in, week out for a lot of, uh, a lot of the things you'll do on the command line. We talked about changing directories, doing the ls command to list what's in a directory, how to create directories and remove directories, how to copy, move, and remove files, all of which, like I said, are things that we'll use um, week to week throughout the rest of this course. So um, you'll get lots of practice in doing these things. Next week, we're going to talk about a couple of other things dealing with um, uh, managing files and managing directories. So we'll get to see a little bit uh, more on similar topics next week, which will be week three. All right, thanks.